we're live. So we're gonna stay muted um, until Tapas will take or if we have any announcements. Hello everyone, welcome to the 6th annual A to Create Art Show, our first ever virtual show. Um, from 10 to 2 p.m. we will have Tina, Jason, Kofi, and Lydia performing. And then from 3 to 7 p.m. we will have Michael, Nikki, Jahi, and Claire performing. So we're so excited to see what you all create and please enjoy the day and the show. Artists, um, if you'd like to introduce yourselves to those viewing the live stream, um, you can go ahead. I think everyone would love to get to know you a little bit more. So we can start with Keenan, if that's okay. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, well, what is it? Uh, my name is Keenan, and I make work. What is it? I'm studying at uh, the University of Illinois, uh, trying to get my MFA. I like to make whatever comes to mind, really. Like, I really prefer working digitally, and uh, that's kind of what I got going uh, here. So, yeah, that's me. Awesome. Lydia, would you like to go next? For sure. Hello, I'm Lydia. Um, I make mixed media illustrations um, that are kind of wood carved. Um, multiple media and I had to cheat a little bit to prep for the show today in terms of designing because maybe with the eight hour mark I would have been able to make something um, fully drawn and everything but I had to kind of work a little bit ahead I put it about six hours ahead of time drawing I mixed all the paint colors um, I did a digital illustration so I would kind of know what I'm doing because I 
just wanted to make the most impact I could today. And otherwise I would have had to work really, really small. So we'll see what I can get done here. We have a harbinger of spring kind of whispering awake. Um, some sleeping shrubs. So we'll see what happens today. Awesome. I'm sure whatever you make, we're going to be so cool. I'm very excited. Um, Kofi, would you like to go next? Um, yeah, sure. So I'm drawing a to a manga. Um, I'll show you guys some images of the manga that I'm working on. This is my series called Rapid Code, which is about uh, anthropomorphic people characters in ancient in an ancient Japan type setting. The story is, is a sort of a metaphor for, uh, for class consciousness. Like there's certain animals who are above others. Sort of like a, uh, what's called a Jedi game. It's a pure piece. Sort of a, a samurai between a, uh, two brothers. One is a rabbit and one is a frog. So I'm going to be working with pages from that. Here are some images of from the party right now I'm drawing a, a double which is going to be two characters looking at a giant camera tree. The tree is going to take up the entire two pages of the spread. Cool. Thank you. Um, and then last but certainly not least is Jason. Hi, uh, so I'm working on uh, what I have started is kind of a simple draw, uh, sketch. Um, and I'm working on a multimedia abstract and a consist of um, some cloth pieces. And I'm kind of working on a mixture right now where I've got a little bit of gesso in here. I'm going to put some plaster and some a um, uh, couple other materials. I have a little bit of house paint. I'm going to mix them with that. And this is going to serve as um, kind of a, a, not only a texture paste, but also uh, an adhesive for the um, uh, the cloth and like this would be an example of some of the cloth like this is a, can a strip of cut canvas from just when I you know would have stretched a canvas um, so that's the kind of thing I'll be using denim um, and like, some t-shirt material um, <laughs> old jeans that um, you know got holes in them I'm just cutting it up um, I kind of did something similar to what Lydia did, where I, I did work ahead because I'd like to have a finished piece at the end of this. Um, a lot of my work requires a lot of dry time. So what I'm going to do is work in three phases, where this is like the first phase. Then I'm going to pull in you know, kind of like a cooking show, a, uh, <laughs> a, a piece that I um, you know began earlier. And then I'm going to kind of take it to the, the, the second phase. Um, and then I'll pull out kind of a third phase and try to get it as close to completion as I can. But honestly, sometimes I'll work in like four or five phases. So we'll see. It just kind of depends on how, how that goes. But um, the reason I do that is because I like to have a lot of layers and sort of work um, on layer by layer. So, you know, similar to drawing, how you do some cross hatching. Um, I'll do some of that kind of thing, but I'll have it like kind of out a little bit more and I'll either that with acrylic or oil or, or even, you know, a finished touch of like a, a charcoal pencil or something like that. And then anyway, so that's kind of what I'm working on. I'm, I found a sketch from like 10 years ago that I'm just sure like, loosely basing it off of this kind of weird drawing that I did. I was like, oh, that, that might be interesting to, to work and have sketch based off some of those concepts. Uh, I'm just sort of identifying um, shapes that I see in there and everything from there. So that's, that's kind of a lot. Thank you, Jason. And just a reminder to the audience watching on our YouTube live stream, feel free to use the chat to ask any questions. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions that you'd like our artists to be asked or any comments at all they would love to hear. Thank you everyone for joining.
would have stopped that too. Some of you watching the live stream, um, the chat might seem like it's disabled, but you just need to refresh your screen and then you should be able to see the chat and comment. Um, if you like to say. Jason, there's a question for you in the chat, so we'll read it out to you. Um, Thomas asks, he says, did Jason say that he added sawdust, and what does that do to the medium? 
Yeah, bro. Um, my my grandfather, uh, he used to um, he was an art educator way back in the day, and I looking at his paintings, I realized that he he mixed um, sawdust and oil paint together, and what what I noticed that it would do to his is just kind of it would give it a different unique texture, and it would um, just sort of ease it up a little bit. It, it, it just gives it a different look. Um, sometimes I'll add a lot of different things that I have in my studio that um, I feel I feel good about just kind of the texture itself, so I'm not worried about the sawdust. Um, but it just gives it uh, kind of a different vibe. Um, I'm going to go to the finished painting really quick. one that it that actually has uh, concrete I'm gonna show you right there so it has concrete on here um, and it just gives a lot of uh, texture so it's not that I'm like a sawdust person I like to explore different textures if that makes sense
often is mined by free soil or is copying a template. If he is doing this off the top of his head, that is amazing. <laughs> Oh, I, I couldn't really hear. I couldn't really hear that. Uh, sorry. <laughs> no worries. I'll put it in chat. That way you can. Okay. Know. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Oh well, I appreciate that. Well, it's it's uh, <laughs> um, what is it? You know, like this is kind of a, a composition that comes from me, uh, but I'm like taking reference uh, from specific like uh, places. So like I'm just I have like images of mountains open, and like I have images of the human body open. So that's kind of how like I uh, operate and how I work, and then like I just bring the composition together, and now I'm just painting it out. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, w I wouldn't necessarily say a template, but, uh, <laughs> you know, just using reference and like just putting together a composition and saying like, oh, well, this is going to have to go here and this is going to have to go here. So, yeah. Hmm. That's really cool, Keenan. I, um, I've spent the last year or so trying to add working on the iPad into my practice to just, you know, try better coloring uh, practice and whatnot and it mm -hmm. is not an easy transition I was <laughs> I, you know working yeah. on paper and having the texture of that with a pencil is sure. nothing like working with a stylus <laughs> holy smokes yeah it's, it's, a, it's a totally it's a different it's a different beast like I, I felt yeah. that when I first started working digitally too I was like oh this is not the same it's <laughs> so slippy <laughs> <laughs> Those pen nibs that go all over the place. <laughs> they do, they do. Yeah. I, I definitely agree. Uh, but like getting it down and just like doing it, 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 it ends up just working. For you, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I will not be sharing my digital sketchbook. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I finished the first step, so I'm gonna monologue for a second about what's going on over here. Um, I use printmaking tools. I just have a V gouge here, um, wood cut tool that I carve all my line work with. So now that that's done, this looks even less like something than when I started because you can't really probably see it on the camera. Um, but now I'm going to erase all the pencil marks and I'm going to coat the whole thing with a black acrylic wash to darken all the marks I just carved. And then I'm going to add color on top of that. So that's what I'll be doing.
We have a question um, via YouTube for Lydia. It says, um, I may have missed it, but what is the material you are working on? What is done? Hey, thanks for the question. I didn't even think to mention that. Um, I am using MDF, medium density fiberboard. It is a wood amalgam. Um, so there's no grain to it. It's much easier to carve in any direction. And I buy it in large sheets, like from Menards, and like two by four foot. And then I just cut them in my garage down to these little sizes that look nicer in a home. Um, I really don't make work for galleries. I make it for kind of a domestic environment. So they're meant to feel somewhere between a tchotchke and a painting and a story. Um, but yeah, that kind of got off topic. The answer was MDF. <laughs> All right. And like Jason said, I have dry time now. So I brought a blow dryer. I'm going to see if I can put the call on me, maybe. Maybe not. Well, I'm just going to blow dry, you guys, so I'll do it away from my headset. We have kind of a follow-up to my question, Maria. It's like, thanks for the response. Do you have a special carving instrument? I am using um, the Power Grip basic wood cut uh, tool set. I've had the same one for probably 15 years that I use um, and just sharpen it as I use it. So it's a... Um, just a wood cut printmaking tool, I suppose, is what I would say. Any would work just fine. But I kind of developed this strategy or process, whatever you want to call it, um, 
kind of to compensate for a shaky hand. I feel like when I draw in pencil, it's not, um, it doesn't express the piece the way I want it to show up. So the woodcut lines just have this feel to them um, that I really relate with, I guess. So I am going to start with colored pencil next. I use Prismacolor pencils for all the backgrounds in my work. Actually, I should come up with uh, some finished pieces really quick so you can see what I'm doing. Okay. I'm going to attempt to move my camera without dislodging everything. Okay, I think I see myself on there. So here's a finished one from the last couple months sometime. And the backgrounds are all done in Prismacolor pencils. I then put on uh, multiple layers of a spray fixative, which I'm gonna skip that step today for dry time and whatnot. Um, and then I treat the foreground characters or whatever scene is going on with acrylic paint. So they end up having a bit more of an opaque poppy feel in the front, in the foreground. Um, this one is telling the story of one of the botanic lives of guinea pigs. <laughs> And you can see here that if you keep a guinea in a terrarium, uh, they will produce berries and grow new guinea pigs all over your floor. So my stories are mostly false and um, pretty imaginary, but that's one thing I've been working on. I also have three guinea pigs hanging out next to me in here. So that's always really fun.
Something a little bit about uh, kind of my process right now. Um, initially, I started with sketch, and since I'm working a little bit more like sloppy and texturally, I'm more so like trying to loosely follow the outline of that sketch. And then what's going to happen is um, I'm going to um, paint it in another process and then try to articulate some more of that definition and then that's when one dry time is going to happen and then i'll try to kind of refine it again to try to bring out some of that texture um based on some of the brush strokes that i'm making um like as, as an example i'm not going to try to hide some of that texture by like painting it all one color i might try to paint multiple colors on a different piece of cloth to kind of bring that out so right now it's a bit of a sloppy process and then it will get a little bit more defined as time goes on. So we have a question for Kofi from the YouTube live stream, and it asks, will you color in your picture? And if so, with what? Um, no, Manga is generally drawn in black and white, and I like to stay true to the medium. So what I do is, um, when I work on my manga, um, I draw it in black and white, and then I scan it in, um, and I edit it on Clip Studio Paint Pro, which is a Photoshop from Manga. And I use gray tones. I use green tones. Not very generally just black white. I can pull up my habit here actually and show you guys what's been completed. I got uh, the live thing going on my phone. After I do the digital edits and add the great tone of so it's black and white with some with some gray tone. Those are colors, but those are just illustration. Yeah. The other one that I have on side on screen here as I'm working is um what this completed page is like um so it's like go edit I do the pencils and of the inks of it. Yeah. I'm drawing a giant temper tree inside of a little bit.
It's a part of it's the, the sacred tree of the Building Kofi, that is really interesting, and I could listen to you talk about those stories all day. Thank you. Yeah, I have a, a pretty big OneNote file. This this is going to be a bit long, so. Ah, oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be fun. I can't wait. I'm like, I'm all this. I'm I'm just drawing chapter two right now, but <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that happens. Don't worry. I notice you're using like a mechanical pencil for your sketching. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is that your favorite tool? I'm just always curious about the pencils little, people choose. Just a little mechanical pencil because so I go over it with ink. So I use of a, course. Yeah. So I use a pen when I draw, which is a standard manga. It's a dip pen with ink, and I'm gonna go over the pencil and erase it. Anyway, so you know it's not like I really need a nice pencil. And for me, these are just really good ergonomically, I suppose. I just yeah. Like pencils. Yeah. It's funny how the you know most affordable, economical things can sometimes yeah. be the best <laughs> for us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You just pick them up from pick a big pack of them up from the store. Right going to schnooks getting some pencils <laughs>
I don't know if my microphone is picking that up, but my guinea pigs are having some words behind me. So if anybody's wondering what the chittering is, <laughs> that's what that is. That's funny. <laughs> it's springtime, so everybody's excited. They get a bit oh, yeah. am- they get a good bit amorous in the spring, even though we, you know, they're neutered. But uh, doesn't matter. <laughs> Did the guinea pigs have any questions for anybody? <laughs> so many. They want to know where their snacks are, for sure, number one. <laughs> At some point, I might take a break here and do a little studio tour or something, just to mix it up and give my hand a break, but I'm going to finish this background first. I don't know if anybody else wants to show off their space. Yeah, I think I'll do that after I finish the my first process I'll, I'll i'll join you in that at, at a certainly different time you know you just want to take a break from the heavy uh hand work here That taking a break. I'm gonna move to a different page for a second and do a little bit of ink. It does seem like people from YouTube would be interested in studio time seeing the guinea pigs, so. Yeah, I am just finishing this first color here and then give me like a couple minutes and I'll be ready to walk you through a little. Hopefully I don't drop my camera. had some very grandiose plans this week of cleaning my studio in case you guys see it and like <laughs> getting stuff finally set up and guess what it didn't happen so <laughs> I guess it's the realistic studio tour that's how it goes yep yeah I'm gonna show you something pretty messy too so, <laughs> I think there were, yeah I think that's probably pretty common with art folk oh yeah finished this so I'm going to att- attempt to do this now let's see all right so anywho this was the first thing first part of it that I finished here I'm gonna try to get you some better details but you can kind of see the 
background and line work is carved in now. And I'll be back to that. So I work in Urbana in my home. And this is kind of the general space I use. It's pretty small. It's just a simple desk area, but we do have a little, we built in a library ladder and uh, space up here. So I always keep whatever I'm currently working on up behind where I work just to kind of live and breathe with it a little. Um, these are digital illustrations that I'm working on a story about my dog. In this story, she's going to be uh, taken over by a demon the night we adopted her. And so we never actually get to live with her. We just live with this thing that's constantly trying to kill us. So that's what's going on back here and then next to where i work is the guinea pigs i'm gonna see if i give them a little snack roll if they'll come say hello hey pigs here's neville this is honky tonks and here comes Shmoopy. <laughs> they are gonna go eat their cookies. So now you can meet Lucy. This is Lucy. This is my girl. Hey, sweetheart. She wants a guinea pig treat too. So she's gonna have one. And she's about 12 years old and a total disaster my girl so I guess if anybody oh yeah I guess there's not much else in here but um, this is my cabinet of mouths <laughs> I, I collect things with mouths so very inspired by big open mouths and teeth so there's that some plants and that's that's the majority of the space, so not super exciting, but I sure do love it, so. I'd love to see anybody else's stuff. I'm gonna try to get my camera back to where it's supposed to be. Get back to work. Thank you for sharing, Lydia, that was cool. <laughs> I, I liked it, I enjoyed it. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that, thank you. I might not share my work yet because there's not really too much to show us in this dead. But um, I give you guys a little book tour of uh, a lot of the books that I like that are related to art. Mm -hmm. So I get a little bit more done here. And just an announcement that you guys have officially been creating art for an hour. Maybe it's felt like less, maybe it's felt like a lot more, but we still have three more hours left. Um, yeah, so just letting you know so you can plan accordingly. I'm excited to see what you guys end up with. Thank you for the time check. It's good to know.
I actually have a question um, for Kofi. I know a little bit of the answer, but I would love if you could expand and tell us a little bit about how you got into manga and just kind of your process with that, because I know it's really unique and I found it quite interesting, and I think the audience would love to hear. Well, um, I, uh, I stumbled upon Dragon Ball Z when I was a kid. Eight years old, and after I saw that, I just decided that's what I want to do. I started doing my manga um, before I knew what comic and manga were. I just knew I was drawing. Ever since I was a little kid, is what I've enjoyed spending my time doing. Um, I wish I wish you would buy another way. And then uh, I thought I speak Japanese now and uh, so since then since like teaching myself how to draw manga uh, I've been under a master in a manga production course back to pursue manga instead of it just being sort of a casual interest so I flew myself to Japan and uh Network with people and started studying the craft and taking it seriously. And now my company is like manga and and keep working. Eventually, I, uh, I want to teach more you know, like in college. Right? So um, there were already many programs. I can get uh, I can get good enough. I plan to go back to Japan. Just more recently. It's been uh, longer making teaching. Uh, Kofi, we're having a few issues hearing your audio, but um, I think we got the gist of it. Yeah, but we're having just a little bit of problems hearing on our end and on the live stream. You can always use chat as well, and I can say what you're looking to communicate as well.
For those of you on the live stream, um, we're having some issues with Kofi's audio. So I'll read off um, what he had to say. And my question was just how he got into manga and what his process looked like. So he said, I started drawing manga when I was a kid. I taught myself how to draw just sitting in my room. Eventually, this led me to studying Japanese. I dropped out of college to become a professor, but I continued self-studying Japanese to have proficient. Then, I flew myself to Japan in 2017 to study manga and to box. After that, I re-entered university. I founded the Japanese Culture Club at my school and began teaching manga workshops and resumed Japanese self-study. Then, returned to Japan in 2019 to study under pro a professional mangaka, I think is how you pronounce that, and took a manga production course. My goal is to improve enough to teach manga in Western academia because manga practice isn't taught in the States, and to eventually make a boxing manga about my experiences, experiences as an athlete. Thank you for sharing that. I, I didn't catch all of it the first time around, and that is super interesting. Super cool. Yeah. Oh, thank you. It's not often that you, well, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't hear art and athletics mixing very often. Maybe that's just my own experience, but man, that's incredible. And with that said, if any of the rest of you um, are interested in sharing how you got into art, um, whether that be through athletics or not, I'm sure everyone would be interested to hear kind of your story as well, if you're comfortable sharing. It's kind of hard to follow such an interesting story when <laughs> uh, I've, I've made art my whole life but I guess mostly I was influenced by my aunt uh, she encouraged me from a young age to pursue my interests in storytelling drawing and narrative things um, I decided to go to school for horticulture and then changed my mind, thank you mom and dad, and went for uh, my bachelor's in art from Northern Illinois. Uh, 
Um, then I, when I graduated, I worked in garden centers for 10 years before really making the push to create art as a full-time uh, lifestyle and job. So now I travel around and well, before pre-quarantine, um, did fine art fairs. Um, I've participated in some of the public art things in town here. Um, but yeah, compared to Kofi's journey, that's not quite as interesting. Any Keenan or Jason? Yeah, it's not as not as interesting as Kofi's journey for sure. Um, my, you know, there, there's. Uh, I think a lot of people wrestle with the idea when it comes to art as to whether or not there's kind of a, a nature or nurture component. Like, is this something that anybody can learn or is this something that somebody's predisposed to? And I, I kind of tend more towards the idea that most people can do art, but, um, but I do think that there is a little bit of that component of like some may be more predisposed. And I would just say that at an early age, um, my brother and I kind of felt like we were artists ever since we were five. Um, I know that's kind of weird to think, but um, so our grandpa was a pretty good artist. And so we always were interested in it. And so it's like we were always doing art. We were always, uh, you know, the idea of being born and, you know, and raised together and um like if he would do something it would challenge me to do something um so ever since we were children we were kind of creating you know works of art and he being two and a half years older than me he always kind of trended a little bit um you know ahead of me um and, and he's a brilliant artist and uh, he ended up going into art education and i did not go that route i uh, i ended up just kind of going the I want to experiment and um, though, I, though I took a few you know college level classes with art that wasn't my my degree and I've, I've kind of been painting on canvas for the past probably uh, 20 years um, and ever since so when I was 18 is really when I first started painting on canvas to kind of extend beyond like you know drawing or you know working on paper and so now I'm 38 years old, um, got a wife and, and a fourth child on the way. And uh, it's just a different uh, you know, level of life, uh, uh, obviously. But um, I don't know, I, I've, I've just been, I've, I've, kind of, I've kind of tried to forge my own path and uh, you know, kind of glean different um, ideas from different people. Um, but but I, I guess I tend towards kind of that 1950s era abstract expressionism. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I, I guess I'm still stuck in the 50s. <laughs> and interested, you know, um, it, interested in some of those ideas. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's me. Um, well, what is it? Uh... I, I really enjoy like hearing uh, everybody's journey with art and I totally agree like um, you know even though there is like a little bit of a predisposition to like um, you know art making and uh, creativity um, I would also like agree with myself and say not really um, anybody <laughs> can, you know anybody can make they, uh, they just have to do is just the stigma around uh, it's just the financial stigma around it like, yes. you know, if, uh, <laughs> if, if art was in the place of engineering, you'd have much, uh, many more artists, right? So, <laughs> yeah. uh, just, it, it's a technical skill to learn how to, uh, what is it, convert your emotions and your true identity into like a, a piece that you share. It's just a, it's just a skill like that has to be uh, crafted. Um, for me, what is it? I um, started off uh, just tracing my uncles and older cousins comic books as a kid um, so that was uh, you know my thing and I just really enjoyed that um, what is it? I didn't really get into uh, art making I guess pseudo professionally until um, undergrad until undergrad and once I got to uh, 
undergrad, that's when I actually started to um, make stuff. I was initially going to university to be a uh, mechanical engineer. That was like the, the path that I was looking at. Um, but I decided to switch it up and do graphic design. And um, I've kind of just been making art since and just like whatever art that, you know, feels right at the time. Wow, that is really interesting to hear all of your stories and I'm sure the audience enjoys it as much as I do. <laughs> so thank you all of you for sharing. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Shannon and she's now going to take over facilitating questions, but um, I'll still be watching on the live stream. So good luck guys and keep on making art. <laughs> thank you. in the chat for all artists. Thomas asks, when they are creating a piece, do any of you guys reach an end point of perfection? Would anyone like to go first? I can't any of us what? When creating a piece? When creating a piece, do any of the artists reach an end point of perfection? Oh. Interesting, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I, I guess I have a finished image in my head when I'm starting. Um, I I can't say it's a it's a a point of perfection by any means, but. 
I am trying to get somewhere when I'm working, so I don't know if that really answers the question, but that is my experience, I guess. Yeah, well, I guess um, from, from like my piece, they have to be finished because eventually it's stories that I have to put out. So mm. I haven't made anything that I would deem as perfect, but um, there's certain very specific end goals for every page that I work with. Um, what is it? <laughs> Me personally said, I would say, oh my God, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no to the 90th degree. Like I, I would just open the thing and do something. <laughs> Me, I just open the thing and do something and whatever works, it works. And whatever doesn't work, I'll just, keep it but i think ultimately the real goal for me as an artist is to be comfortable with whatever i do like regardless of whatever uh whatever paradigm or whatever movement or whatever school of thought um whatever i do i recognize it as perfection as opposed to seeking this external like validation of perfection so that's that's the goal for me so uh for me i'm like no <laughs> there, there is no uh there's no end point. Like, you know, if I if I just end this here, like it's me being comfortable with it, saying like, this is it. Do you go back and revisit a lot of work or do you, when you're done, you're done? Oh my God, when I'm done, I'm done. I'm nice. like, <laughs> me too. <laughs> Goodbye. Done, nice. like to <laughs> I religiously do not revisit work. <laughs> <laughs> I revisit the fault. <laughs> Sometimes I'll do like, you know, five processes or whatever. I'll go at it like five times because of all the dry time. And uh, so it's kind of, sometimes it's hard to know when to finish. And because it's it's abstract and expressionism, typically I will sometimes want to keep it more simplified and not refined. And sometimes I'll refine to a fault and I'm like, oh, this needs more detail. And then it just becomes uninteresting. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, so it's like, I'm, that's the balance that I, I think with, with the thing that I'm doing, I probably uniquely have to think about that because I've ruined a lot of ideas and compositions by overdoing it. Um, yeah. Like over rendering something when you're shading it, it's like, yep, yep, I get that. <sighs> I think too, this past year, kind of my personal goal, I, I have a I have an interest in a lot of patterns, uh, wallpaper, carpets, things that relate kind of to domesticity um, and trying to find the point where it's so busy that it's almost hectic and hard to see, but pulling it back one from there so that it's these, really let me pull one over here saturated pet layers of patterns so this is the most recent thing i was working on um it's a mm. ghost in the greenery here and there's a back background shrubbery a plant and then a ghost and they're all kind of layered on top of one another and you're transparently seeing through them creating these patterns so i guess i want it to feel like there shouldn't be one more thing on here because it'll ruin it mm. i have not succeeded with this yet i still think <laughs> i could have done more on this particular painting um but th that's kind of my current uh challenge to myself i guess Ooh, ghost it's awesome <laughs> ghost just hiding <died. laughs> ghost just flew out of there <laughs> i have a very complicated relationship with ghosts in that i don't know if i believe in them but I'm fairly sure I've seen one. Mm. But I also am not a religious person in any way. I was mm. raised atheist and I still am atheist, but I don't know how to explain some things. And so it's kind of uh, 
a repeated interest of mine. Our my childhood home was uh, very safe and wonderful, but also very creepy. And once I moved out, my parents, well, my sister and I had both grown up and moved out. They admitted that <laughs> they knew that there had been uh, a death, a rather upsetting death in our basement <laughs> oh. <laughs> from the previous owners. And we always knew it was so spooky down there. Oh, yeah. So anyway, I'm rambling about ghosts. But... <laughs> <laughs> I anyway, like ghost stories. <laughs> I love I love them, but I've always been too scared about them. I mm. I've kind of never desensitized to spookiness. So that's fair. That's fair. Uh, yeah, but I love them. I, I'm fascinated by them. Uh, so yeah, that's something that I guess I, yeah, one of the themes I work on is spirits. A much thicker application than some of my other pre big ideas, but that's fine. I'm gonna work on adding a little bit of black now so it won't look uh, undefined on the camera. I, I do notice that it's probably hard to tell what the heck I'm even doing. <laughs> Apologies. Isn't that like the first two thirds of any piece though? Is it really is? You're going along and you're like unimpressive, unimpressive, keep yeah. going, and then blammo. Yep, yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's real. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, I mean, kind of the way I work, I would even consider what I just did to be my stretched canvas with gesso. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. this is just my, my sort of underlayer that I've got going on. Mm. Yeah, that's a little block you got going on there. Say the last part again. That is a fun little block you oh. got going on there. <laughs> I, li I like that, uh, that, that thing. You guys got some great stuff going on. You all as well. I'm just now finally taking a step back to see really great stuff. All of you. Thank This is one of the fun parts for me. After I get the paint out, um, I start erasing the pencils, and it gets a lot more clear. Mm. It's really good. To do it. Is there a special kind of paper that you work on, Kofi? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I use called Minko Yoshi Manga. 
and that must hold up better than to like all the erasing and whatnot. It's great. Yeah, it's it's kind of like a like a slick pencil, basically. <laughs> it's um, it feels a lot more like it holds the ink very well, and um, it doesn't like scratch and tear away when you use the pen really sharp. It sort of pays for G pen to break. Hmm. It's pretty similar to like Western uh, comic paper, actually. Kind mm. of just like, just like a bristol, smooth bristol. unnecessary <laughs> just a feather that I used to wipe away eraser shavings <laughs> I could I could easily use my hand <laughs> I like to use the feather use the feather yep. it's a pretty common tool for mangaka um but I, mean, I don't I mean we could just use our hands I guess <laughs> just, it feels more authentic to you yeah. Yes, yeah, speaking of tools, I guess <laughs> my sad little paintbrush here that I use to kind of uh, burnish the colored pencil into the wood, it acts so I can really see like where it has needs another hard uh, application. Uh, but I think I've rubbed this old paintbrush down to the nib here and then my palette for paint is old contact cases that I, huh. uh, it's nice because they're small they stay nice and tight and keep the paint fresh but it is not very aesthetic <laughs> but it works yes. I don't know there is something aesthetic about that not <laughs> the
Yeah, I'm going to step away for one moment. I'll be right back. Um, I'm not sure if you answered this. How long have you been practicing? Because you must have like some really steady hands. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, I mean, I've been doing it since I was like eight years ago, since I was a little kid. It's kind of what I've always enjoyed doing since I was little. And when I first started growing, it was manga. crisp and so steady it's just like wow yeah. 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 I do still make and I keep I keep white out on me in case there's just that
We have a question in the chat from Maria for all the artists. How do you guys feel that the problem pandemic affected your art and creative process? Both good or bad? I would say, let's see. Um, I would say there there is like you know a damage in terms of like going outside and the frequency of like how much how often you go outside. Um, especially when it comes to just like um, experiences and like being able to like create stuff based off your experience and seeing like more and more things is like that's like limited. Sometimes like you just want to go to the park and just chill. Sometimes you want to go out and have a good time and then reflect on that experience later. And then that becomes like a piece. So like on that end, it's been negative. Uh, but also on the positive note, there's been like a lot of space to uh, do a lot of introspection. So. I definitely agree with that, with the space for introspection. I think in for what I had to deal with this year, it was it didn't feel like the right time to want to share these kind of silly um, escapist absurd things that I create. There was so much more important things happening for much of the last 18 months that uh, that was a little, you know, it's, it's just you don't want to take away from the important things happening in the world. So I kind of shut my mouth on social media for a few months last year and just worked quietly by myself. Um, you know, now that there appears to be some goodness in sight, hopefully with uh, vaccinations and whatnot. I feel like it's maybe okay to be more hopeful and uh, to start sharing these kind of stories again that are, you know, not in the forefront for what needs to be focused on. So I guess that was a little bit of a different challenge. Well, for me, uh, I had I had actually got I had gotten I was accepted to live in an atelier in Tokyo, which is like. That was like a really big deal for me because um, it's where Osama Tezuka, he's considered like the godfather of manga. It's his old apartment and they've changed it into an atelier that um, basically produces professional manga. And I was, uh, was going to be the first American to live there. And then COVID hit and I, I had got like scholarships to pay for it. I got accepted. I did my interview and everything. And then because of COVID, I wasn't able to get my scholarship funded, so I didn't get to go to school. That's the oh. biggest. That is heartbreaking. A, I've Sorry been able to, to hear that, man. So, but uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I didn't get to go to Japan. But on the flip side, I've been able to get so much more work done. <laughs> and, um, in 2020, I started like giving talks and presentations, and it's nice to be able to just get paid for doing a talk while I'm just sitting in my, room. you know. So that yeah. that it, it it was nice to see the sort of flexibility that everybody has to be able to meet and connect and get work done without leaving the house. So in a weird way, sort of the silver lining, I realized the possibilities that this picked up. For me, there was a lot of good that came out of it, being a father of uh, one on the way. And uh, I would say that nothing has actually uh, impacted my work more than having that amount of children, because it's been... <laughs> to get it down and actually make something um but you know there there was a i feel like we we're burning the candle at both ends with how busy our family was being and so in some ways it was it was good on a personal level um to be forced to engage with the people i love and live with um 
I ended up, you know, finishing our basement and made a nice play space for them. And then, uh, and then I also, that's where my studio is too. I do voiceover and uh, audio production. And so I've got one space in the basement dedicated to that and one space in the basement dedicated to the artwork and then a space for them. Um, but I would say that um, it's probably not impacted my work negatively. Awesome. But my children have. <laughs> but I love them. <laughs> Does that mean you've been doing uh, school from home and whatnot, Jason? Oh, I work. I am. Uh, I am. Uh, oh, I meant for off. your kids. I'm sorry. Oh yes, yes. In oh, fact, boy. We, my, yeah. My, well, my wife was actually homeschooling before that, so oh. it was not a different transition for my family and. Um, it meant that I was working from home sometimes. So yeah, that was a really good thing to, you know, we were, it was hard to not connect with people like we were uh, at one point, but, um, but it was, you know, we, uh, it, it kind of gave us a little bit of balance in a, in a, in a different way, but we certainly lost balance in another way, you know? Sure. Yeah, my uh, husband, my partner works for the university, so we were lucky that he was able to, you know, come home, keep working virtually, and it was, you know, no no hiccup there. But I was so, you know, we've let's see, we've been married um, about 15 years, and we've never spent so much time together. Just our usual jobs from back in the day were opposite schedules and. It's been so nice to have meals together every day. So I completely agree with the silver lining and, you know, a lot of great stuff came out of this too for some of us. Yeah, I like working at home. I'm in school, so all my classes, I just do my classes on Zoom and I stay home with my dog. I, get, I feel like I get a lot more time because I have to be on campus. Mm-hmm. All right, so I have finished my pencil work. I'm going to see if I can get this in frame here. Yeah. So now is when I would usually spray this with a few coats of um, permanent fixative, um, let it dry for a full 24 hours before I work on it again. So I'm going to skip that step and do it after, you know, off camera today. But now I'm gonna move on to uh, the foreground and I paint the characters and whatever the story of the scene is in acrylics to kind of pull it to the foreground. And at least that's my theory of how this works. So hopefully it'll be successful. Um, but you can kind of see my creature spirit here is sending out and this whisper of springtime magic to the ground and everything in you know this area is going to be brighter colors and pops and um i've mixed up four different greens i'm going to work with for this so that's where i'm moving on well i think i'm ready to do a little bit of a studio tour now that i've finished um kind of my phase one of my project and then I'll take a quick break but uh, I have a uh, just a ton of artwork that's just lying around on a bit of art rack so I'll just kind of begin to show you some pieces that I've done and may maybe get a good idea where where this might be going um, so here's some here's my uh, my art rack I don't know that my lighting is very good here so let me turn a light 
Um, I'll just kind of carry a light with me. But um, that's my art rack. Um, I've kind of made it out of wheels, and I've got a ton of uh, ton of artwork over there. But uh, I'm, I'm going to hook this light up and maybe just start to grab some pieces to show. This is kind of one I've got in the process. It's very undefined. Um, it's it's going to end up being something we're doing at our, our church that they asked me to do for Good Friday. So it's just kind of the underlayment with, you know, no detail at all. Um, and it's just kind of hanging out here. This is, uh, this is one that's a little bit more, um, a little bit more detail. It's a landscape. Um, See if I can. Yeah, this is our where um, my wife's family has a summer home, and it's just kind of a, a scene from there. The it's got oil. Um, I'll, I'll bring it in close to see some of the 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 detail on here and how it's just kind of raised from the canvas. And I still use kind of canvas strips even when I do more of a uh, a landscape like this. Um, I don't, I don't like working with like too refined of, of a look, um, just because I, I'm just really drawn to texture. It's very fun to me, um, but you'll probably notice that I have really a varied style. It's almost like I hate to recreate the same thing. Um, this one's on wood board and it's pretty heavy and it's, uh, Kind of a little bit more just straight up abstract. Um, as you can see, I've kind of emphasized a lot of texture and color. Is that coming through decently? Yes. Okay. A lot you of know, color. Not, maybe not the details, but I think both of those you've shown, that's been a very nice uh, visual. Okay. Yeah, I can't imagine that I've always struggled with the, the detail coming through because of all the texture that I use. So it's hard to like articulate that. Um, I'm, and I'm, I'm not very good with lighting. <laughs> kind of where the key comes in uh, w with doing that. And anyway, so there's this one. This is kind of much less detail and more so an emphasis on celebrating amorphous blobs. This is a smaller one and it's really raised. I used like carpet and wood and just a ton of um, upholstery stapling. Um, it's very colorful. Hmm. It's very small. It's very weird. Can I very... see it from, can you turn it to the side so I, you can see like the relief? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Got like buttons here from like a shirt. <laughs> carpet and so then you'll see like so this is probably like four processes um and then like at the, on the finish you'll notice that i've got like oil paint like swipes to uh yeah i've got about 40 more like all this wow <laughs> so, I don't know where to like really stop, but this is kind of what I'm in the process of still. Um, I kind of hate the blue over here, so I got to figure that out. Um, but it's just, these are vessels. They're just kind of like uh, pottery on a table. Um, I'm trying to think if that's a good way. This has got a lot of relief on it as well. I use some of those same carpet strips. This one's a bit more, uh... <sighs> see how I've got a smashed can on there? <laughs> it's kind of like celebrating uh, garbage a little bit. <laughs> the re uh, a, lot, a lot of my work is kind of like, you know, taking, uh, 
taking the old rag and, and trying to make something that's visually nice. Let me, uh, I did a series of hours where kind of that was the emphasis. This whole deal, it's kind of got a more like pop vibe about it. With all the pinks and teals and rats and taz. But I tend to not do anything. Um, I, I tend to be very different every time I, I start a new project. I could literally do that for a long time because I have uh, too, too much art that I just need to get rid of. <laughs> Well, I'm going to take a break personally, and then when I come back, I'll uh, I'll begin kind of my phase two. midway point we have about two more hours left if you guys would like to share what phase you're at um your art making process or what you're currently doing that would be great well, i'll move to another page um that i'm just about finished inking. um and then i uh i think i'm gonna go ink another page that i've already penciled and i should i should be able to get both of these done by then and and move back to the first one. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get the very first one done by the end of this, which is why I wanted to move to the other two. So I'll have at least two, two completed on, on camera today. So uh, where I'm at right now is just uh, going from like large values into medium values. So I'm going from uh, what is it just big details to a little to smaller details or medium details and then um we'll see if we have time for like texturing but i'll try to get some refinement in this stage and just uh you know get some of the uh value shifts like down and just you want a lot of gradients <laughs> it's just gonna be a lot of gradients Yeah, I'm at the, I guess, the medium details as well, still kind of filling in any remaining um, prime black space on here. Also, like Keenan, we will see how many layers of detail I can get during this time. start making another page as I let this one dry. And I'll start with doing the panel borders first. Panels so they can be seen a little bit more clearly. And then I'll get to my G pen and uh, ink it. Thank you. 
<laughs> it's an emergency my dog needs in I'll be right back Zoom out at all, or do we ha do I have a decent picture here? Anyway, I'm gonna start my, my sort of second phase here. This would be post dry time. texture based because I want the final to have more more texture.
I'm using gouache right now. Keenan, are you back and ready to create and answer some questions? <laughs> yes, I am. See, I had a snack and I stretched and I feel good. <laughs> that so, art is so what attracted you to digital art opposed to any other traditional or physical mediums? Money. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically. Um, what is it? No, um, uh, what is it? Uh, I love uh, video games and I love, uh, uh, what is it? 3D design was like my initial goal, but I didn't really like understand that at the time. I just kind of loved video games and loved art, right? So I, I would make a, uh, what is it? I would make art in the style of concept art. So that was uh, super fun for me and it was kind of just digital because that's what I knew. But also I was like, I don't wanna spend a whole bunch of money on materials all the time. So <laughs> let's just use this tablet and then uh, we'll save a lot of money. So that is kind of like how I started working uh, digitally for the most part. Up for my whole life, it had been traditional. Um, and I remember uh, Lydia was mentioning the thing of like trying to switch to digital. Yeah, it's, it's hard. Like <laughs> when I first started, I would uh, pick it up and put it down so many times. Like, All right, well, forget this. <laughs> the charcoal light. Uh, so, yeah, but uh, after a while, it kind of just stuck and I was able to start figuring out more in terms of just not only um, like art making and like Photoshop, but also uh, doing more design stuff in Illustrator and then After Effects and then Blender and then like coding, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it was a good space for me creatively, that kind of just kept evolving. That is so funny because it really is discouraging when you can't master something, right? I mean, at least maybe for me, maybe that's just me, but uh, yes, I do tend to get discouraged quite easily. And yes, I angrily put that iPad down so many times, <laughs> swore it off and no, it's a wonderful tool. <laughs> I, I understand. Oh Although I'm still, yeah, rickety with it. It just takes its own, it takes its own type of practice, but you're already an artist. So you're like, I already know what I'm doing. And then it's like, no, you don't. Um, so that's the biggest hurdle. I felt like it wouldn't be authentic if I didn't have one of my guinea pigs visiting my table because this is honestly how I work. So mm, mm. <laughs> Shmoo is now hanging out with me just for a short amount of time here because she's so cute. Yes. I am back. 
question to Jason. As you are making abstract art, what are you thinking about? Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, usually <laughs> something different every time. Uh, like, uh, with regard to the art, or is it like just what's on my mind? I think you can answer in any way possible. Either what's in your mind or your thought process regarding the art. Yeah. Uh, you know, in a lot of ways, it's a good a good way to kind of clear my headspace. Um, I mean, with this piece in particular, um, I would say that I'm. I know that in my mind that I'm drawing from um, uh, inspiration from what, one of my favorite artists, which is Lee Bontecu. Uh, she's, uh, I think she's either late 90s or she's passed away, but she used to create really interesting, um, very large visuals. Uh, when she was a young artist, and they kind of always would go to this like hole in the center, kind of like what I've got going on right now. It almost looks like uh, all of her work kind of looked like a black hole, and it was some of the most relief uh, painting I've ever seen. Some of her work would come uh, off a canvas, uh, you know, about a foot in length, and she would kind of stretch different cloths and everything together. But she didn't really use a lot of paint. But I'm I'm kind of nodding to her in this in this particular painting um, just because I really like I'm really drawn to the um, that she uh, but it, you know on a personal level it, it's a time for like a, a mission I've got kids it's a time for me to get away and listen to what I want to listen to um, to think to have some peace you know what I mean um, my kids are young so it's uh, you know it's not my art is not my um, my my career um, it's it's a hobby that I can earn money doing but um, if, if the money um, an add-on bonus to the fact that I get to kind of escape and create and uh, have some peace, you know what I mean? When you say it's your getaway to like listen to tunes or whatever, I'm always curious what other artists and uh, creative types are listening to or like what do you guys work to do you work to TV podcast music uh, I'll, I'll go first since I mentioned it I will uh, I will listen to podcasts I will sometimes listen to Radiohead I will sometimes listen to uh, like Christian worship music and those are kind of the three that I go between and then I will also listen to silence <laughs> <laughs> what is it um it's funny i used to listen to music all of the time and um i have like a large like a uh, very diverse like playlist like it, it'll just be whatever's you know whatever's come to mind but recently i've kind of discovered well I, you know I, I make music and i love making music um it's so important to me um, but in order to kind of get my voice onto a track and start to, uh, you know, get some of the emotion that I feel on the track, I had to stop listening to music when I create art. So that was wild. Um, that was, that was weird, uh, because I just noticed that, um, the music that I listen to becomes like my internal soundtrack. It's like, oh, like this is, you know, this is the uh, this is the vibe of this piece. This is the vibe of this emotion. This is the vibe of this event. Um, and I wasn't able to separate like, okay, what is it? A different artist song versus like the music that I wanted to uh, create. So it was just interesting. It was just an interesting thing. So I mainly work in silence now, nowadays. 
So Koki shared in chat that it's definitely worth the music. Composers like Joe Hitachi. Oh hey, I'm 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 here. Sorry guys, my phone died, so I'm just gonna be here working while that's charging because my phone is my overhead camera setup. Mm -hmm. It just all of a sudden hit zero. No. Yeah. Honestly, I'm taking a break and feeding my guinea pig in the camera, so. <laughs> you guys do what you want. I gotta take a break. Oh, I'm not sure if I'm in the, in the stream. So this is what I've got on this kind of second piece. I'm going to um, maybe leave it here for a second, get some more, more thoughts, and kind of work on a pre-made uh, third piece that I've got kind of ready for it. That's basically at this stage. And uh, I think I'm going to transition to using oil paint. I've been using um, uh, gloss paint and uh, the other So question for all artists not related to art. What is your favorite part about living in the Champagne Oak community? Hmm. I like that there's a lot of uh, artsy stuff to do and uh, like music festivals and really interesting events, not just like going out. Cause I'm not really a fan of bars or clubs.
the oh I, I turned my mic off um i like the um just just how creative just to jump off of kofi just how creative everybody is and the yeah. the support for uh the creative it's like that yeah. is like you know incredible like yeah. i i not seen you know i haven't seen many communities but <laughs> i haven't seen uh many communities like this that are so uh, willing to support one another with regard to the arts is yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there. Uh, I am definitely not one to leave the house, so it's got not a lot to do with, <laughs> like you're saying, the... the uh, yeah. Social scene, not as much, but our public arts uh, departments, uh, 40 North and the Urbana Public Arts Association have been great. wonderful. Yeah. This is, I think, the third college town in Illinois that we've lived in, and this is by far my favorite mm. place to right. live it's just so i'm using a little bit of china marker for kind of some uh you know, cross hatching or whatever before i start my my oil finish I love I like uh, trying to make more, um, more than charcoal for kind of finish work. It doesn't smear as much. routinely show you guys what I got down here until I get my camera back set up this is uh this page is drying pretty well now this is the one that I was inking before it's a it's a bamboo forest basically and then at the bottom you'll see some feet running and the uh, the uh, the lettering right here is that's in katakana so Japanese is composed of three different alphabets and katakana is used for non-japanese borrow words and for onomatopoeia and those are they're called giongo it's a really integral part of manga and it says za 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 which is um the sound effect for fast moving footsteps giongo is a really important part of part of manga so even though i make my works in english and japanese i try to include the Japanese Gyongo, because there's not really an English equivalent, and I just type. I usually type like a little, little explanation at the bottom in the final draft, if um, for the, for the English version. It's really nice, man. Thank you. Kofi, though it's not manga, I, I just started reading, well, this past year I started reading my first graphic novel. Oh, yeah? It's just something I haven't been exposed to before. And I picked okay. up um, with Buffy the Vampire Slayer season, oh, really? like, eight. Yeah. It is so, it's such a fun, I'm just seeing, you know, the way you tell your stories panel by panel on that yeah. page. It's just such a different approach to, you know, narrative. And it's yeah, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. fascinating so it's really fun the, the the kind of things that you can do with it um because um you know unlike animation or film um the way that you uh sort of like the temporal aspect the, the way that you can convey time 
there's a lot of things yeah. that you can do there based on like how far apart your facial panels or sort of any kind of foreground or background effects that you add into the panels the sort of pacing of your comic you can kind of control how long it takes your reader to read something um if you have a lot of text or a little bit of text um so even though it's not moving you can still play around with time a lot i, I think it's, that's really cool part of comics it is and and reading them is so different than taking in a novel or yeah. watching a show yeah. just the the ability to go back through it yeah. like i found yeah. myself yeah. you know kind of taking in the whole story as one read through and then going back and i definitely didn't identify all the things you're saying so now i need to go on like read through number four or whatever <laughs> um and try to pick up on those subtleties but yeah 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 you know a good um a good artist to check out i guess since um since my phone is charging right now and we have me on camera, this would be a good time to show off some of my books and I can get into what I was just explaining. I'll be right back. Please, yeah. really famous thinker and comic artist. Um, he has a series, there's Understanding Comics, Making Comics, and uh, Reinventing Comics. This is Making Comics right here. This is a um, really important book to me. I read it when I was younger. And it's sort of a breakdown intellectually of what comics is as a medium and the different things that you can do with it. But the interesting thing about it, it's like a textbook about comics, but it is a comic, and he's the character teaching you about comics in the story. So he drew himself like huh. within the comic, explaining comics. Um, it's really, really interesting, really fascinating, and really deep. And um, it showed me that there's a really, there's a really deep intellectual side to comics, and there's a lot to it. Right? It's not just superheroes. It's not just kid stuff. Um, it's the marriage of words and pictures and you know when you combine two elements like that words and pictures it creates this really unique dynamic and McLeod does a really wonderful job of explaining um, and showing um, all the different things you can do with that sort of combination that's Scott McLeod I really recommend him to get a really really good understanding of what comics is capable of and also how to read it, how to read comics. I really like Scott McCloud. And then um, I'll also show you guys, this is, this book is kind of torn up. Um, this is like my manga Bible right here. So I, um, like I said, I studied, a, I studied in Japan a couple of times. I studied manga. The second time that I went um, I was studying at Kansai Gaidai University, uh, which is just a foreign language university, but they had a manga production course, uh, which was taught uh, by this lady who got her PhD at Kyoto Seika University, which um, that's the number one manga research institution in the world. There's actually one place in the world you can get a graduate degree in manga, like in manga practice or in manga theory. It's, it, they take it very seriously, only place in the world like that. Um, and I got lucky with some connections and the professor that I studied under while I was taking her course, I met her old professor at Kyoto Seika University, Professor Akira Soso, and um, I started studying under him. So I got to go to Kyoto Seika campus. Every Monday I would audit his course, I would go into his office uh, and learn really cool stuff about manga. And he like started to give me homework. Like I remember one of the really specific assignments he gave me was how to shape muscles properly. He told me to order a, uh, a 25 high tech C ballpoint pen to use that because it's really fine line to, to shape my muscles. Um, but I, yeah, I learned a lot from him about manga storytelling. And it's cool, they actually have like a manga storytelling department, right? So There's a whole school department dedicated to manga storytelling. And this is the textbook, right? So this is, um, this is a book all about manga storytelling. It's only available to Kyoto Seika students. Um, it's not written in English, it's only in Japanese. And Professor Soso was one of the co-authors of the book. So I got this really, really cool 
book just from talking to this guy and talking to him and feeding him in his office every day and giving me homework. And this has sort of become my Bible. And it's got a lot of examples from, uh, from short manga drawn by the, by the writers of the book. Um, there's just a lot of lessons in here that I've learned. I, I have some on my YouTube channel where I translate some of it. Um, so this book is really important to me also for studying comics and manga. Really cool, man. Is the artist community within manga as welcoming as the other artist communities I've experienced where people are just excited to share and help you gain a footing? Um, so I haven't met very many mangaka, but I think kind of the understanding is uh, there's a lot of loners. I mean, you know, it really it really depends. There's something sort of embedded into Japanese culture about being welcoming to, to visitors and to guests. It's sort of a part of the from the Bushido code. It's called it's called duty, which means dutiful obligation to society. So that's kind of a overall cultural thing. So I think one of the reasons why I was accepted by these mangaka because it's not like I was particularly good at manga. It was more so because I'm this foreigner, I'm this black guy who speaks Japanese, and really interested in manga. So they opened, you know, with welcoming arms. I think because I showed an interest in their culture and their language. Uh, I think that kind of crosses, uh, I don't think that has much to do with the fact that I was in the manga community, but that's just been my experience in Japan and through boxing also is just being really open to foreigners who, uh, who endeavor to speak the language. Um, but I haven't met too many mangaka other, except for just online. As far as I'm concerned, uh, people are they tend to be loners, but I don't think there's people who like are particularly unwelcoming. Um, they can be rather secretive and they like to work like sort of on their own though. Mangaka usually it's not like uh, how in Western comics it's a uh, kind of like an assembly line. Like you have a penciler, you have an inker. You have um, somebody who does the wording. You have somebody who writes the story. Generally, in manga, there's one person who creates everything, and they might hire assistants to draw backgrounds and stuff like that. But it's a lot of people who work alone. <laughs> as far as I understand it. So I lied about the oil paint. I'm, I, uh... <laughs> I lied about chalk because I decided, you know, I got this piece of brown chalk. I'm gonna, so I gave that a try. And so now I'm just kind of blending with uh, gouache and, uh, and that brown chalk. And I'm kind of liking what's happening. So I think this is probably going to be just a, a gouache only painting. I love the color palette, Jason. Thank you. I'm, I'm keeping it uh, minimal. Uh, sometimes I do every color, and I think <laughs> I'm just going to pick a few colors here and, and be a little bit more disciplined there.
There's a question for Kofi. Would you ever do a manga story about boxing? Um, yes, I have actually. I've done a, I've done a short story uh, about boxing. Um, I've been doing a lot of short stories and submitting them to competitions. Um, right now, I'm working on my first sort of longer series piece. Um, but eventually, like I always feel like I'm always growing, and I don't think I'm at the stage yet to make a compelling boxing piece, which that's something sort of the thing that I know the most about outside of art and manga. So I, I want to make sure that I'm good enough to make my boxing piece, basically. Eventually, I want to tackle something that's pretty significant, though. But so far, I've done one short story that was about, it was actually about death and boxing. Um, the last time I was in Japan, I, I drew a 30 page story um, addressing sort of death in boxing and because um, that's, you know, that's a real, that's a real thing. So it was kind of more like a seinen. Usually when you think of manga or anime, you think shonen, which translates into young boy. That's like Dragon Ball, Naruto, one sort of um, coming of age, teenage boy stories, a lot of high action and adventure and happy times. But seinen is more... Um, uh, they can be dark, but it's more uh, more geared towards an adult audience and um, some uh, more dramatic, deeper themes, wider range of content. So that was more of a saint boxing piece. That I did. It's a lot more realistic than this story about anthropomorphic samurai animals that we're growing now. Thank you for sharing. There is a question following up to that. Would you ever want to see your manga transition into an animated style like anim like anime? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I would love that. Um, so I don't know much about animation, but uh, pretty much the way it works um, in the Japanese manga industry is if your manga is good enough, you submit it to a publisher, usually through competition, and it gets picked up into a serialized piece. And if that gets popular, then an animation studio will pick it up. So down the line what i would love to have is if i have something good enough um an animation studio will want to pick it up and i could sort of work in sort of more of the director process sort of like head writer kind of to oversee what's going on with the story but i wouldn't directly work with animation that's the dream anyway i myself am a anime watcher so it's kind of interesting to hear oh, you cool. talk about like sort of the behind the scenes how it's picked up i'm not aware that the studios or productions are the ones that choose like what they want to work with. yeah yeah right yeah yeah it's um there's a lot of agents at play and the people who make the anime they're not the original creators right they work out a deal with the publishing company who took the piece of the original mangaka so there's a lot of hands on it yeah yeah that's, that's generally that's how it works it starts as a manga it gets picked up by a publishing company and if it's popular a studio will, will pick it up after that and um i think it's a really good time for, uh, for black manga and black anime, to be honest. So, you know, this is a Japanese medium, but there are so many black artists who are making really big moves in the manga industry, in the international industry. Manga, it's a pretty parochial medium. Like I said, you can pretty much only get an education in manga in Japan, as far as I'm aware of. Maybe there's some, I know there's some animation studios in, um, in Korea, but that's different than manga. Um, but there is one which was fairly recently opened several years ago, run by Artel Isom. It's a Black-owned anime studio in Tokyo. And um, there are a lot of... Um, there's sort of a burgeoning 
black uh, manga artist and uh, black anime community. And I think within the next several years, we're going to be seeing a lot of a lot of prominent black manga and anime. <laughs> Yeah, no, I definitely heard of that um, video. Like, I yeah, remember yeah. seeing an article news about it. It's so cool. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, I think they've done a little bit of work um, for Attack on Titan and some other major titles. If I'm not mistaken, uh, don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure it was something like they did something for Attack on Titan for some of the episodes. So, a question for all artists: Develop or set up your art style? You're working on figuring out what my art style is. <laughs> Something that an artist told me once. Uh, this was a tattoo artist, actually, a guy who did uh, tattoos is uh, when I asked him what my style was, this is way back when I was 18 years old, he responded by saying, what makes you think you're good enough to have a style yet? Because <laughs> uh, you're still learning. And I feel like I'm still learning. And basically what he told me was, take your three or four favorite artists, figure out what you like about their styles, and figure out how to draw that. That was his advice, actually. So I kind of like that. So. Um, I have some artists that I really look up to, and I try to adapt some things uh, from them. Mostly, Naoki Urasawa is my favorite artist and storyteller. Lydia, Jason, if you know, would you guys like to chime in with that, that question? I, I can answer kind of from my perspective. I I, um, I like what you just said about uh, your kind of your three favorite artists. Uh, I think that that's a good way that I, like I mentioned earlier, this particular piece, I'm trying to sort of tap into a woman named uh, Lee Bonicu. I really like what she made. Uh, may, maybe later, if I get an opportunity, I can. Um, maybe do a screen share um she's a very very famous but i also really enjoy artists like julian schnabel and what he would do is he would take a lot of broken glasses and apply it to uh, very large um canvases he also got into film and uh i i, I really kind of hated his later work um I, he got really like overly simplified and stuff and i, I just like the the weird things that he was doing where he was trying to uh, play with the tension of um, something on a canvas that um, is visually appealing um, but also like trying to deal with the the obstacles of painting around broken glass you know what I mean like that that's one of the cool things about um, so many different art forms is when you think about it they really all have their own obstacles and um, confines that you have to work within and uh, so some of the times um, I would even think like, well, how can I make a new rule for myself? How can I sit like, so with this piece, I, I was like, okay, I'm going to do uh, lines and circles and kind of watching how they intersect. And it's like, so I, I kind of defined rules for myself within it. And I found that like, uh, yeah, in, in you, you could say about art that art is like wide open, right? Because it is like, you can do whatever you want, but also, um, you know, I think about like all of us are, are creating something that um, we're kind of going down a path. Like Kofi's path is super obvious in, in that it's like it's more, it's a very defined path. Like it's like this is what I'm doing, right? I'm 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 studying in this way, and it's like, well, it, he he's he's confined by the the type of art, and I feel like I I try to. Um, I feel like an artist it, it will do themselves good to um, to put parameters and definitions around themselves and try to like 
you know, it's like try, trying to create a jail cell, but then like bumping up against that jail cell as much as you possibly can. I don't know. Um, so I love, I love Da Vinci. I love, um, I, I, I love, uh, I don't know. I, I, I tend more towards, uh, you know, kind of the modern 1950s era, but, um, I don't, I don't know. I just love so many artists and I hate so many artists. And so it's like, yeah. I'm trying to uh, grab Sometimes I'll just like, uh, w when Kofi said finding the three that he likes, like, I really like that idea because I, I kind of think in that way, almost every time I create a piece, I want to pull this person, this person, and this person, but I, but I don't keep my same three every time. If that makes sense. I keep yeah. kind of changing it up a little bit. Yeah. I had a design Sorry. professor explained to us once that uh, limitations inspire or can inspire creativity so when we that's why there's certain parameters set up when you do assignments in certain art courses because if the assignment is just make some art and do whatever you want you might sit there scratching your head figuring out like you know oh, I'm not really sure where I want to take this or you might go to what you already know and not be able to expand your practice but if you put set up certain parameters and certain limitations and you can make you put push those limitations into a direction you're not used to then you might surprise yourself and you can discover while you're creating yeah. yeah that's yeah, I find that I very much agree with all of that. And I think it's been more for me about the small, slow steps. This has been, I mean, 10 years of kind of working in this style, in quotes. Mm -hmm. um, but it started with, I studied some metalsmithing when I was at the university. And when I graduated, I thought I would continue with that. So these actually started with brooches on these pieces. So it would be kind of, you could take the main character off and wear it. And, oh. um, you know, there were, it was much more mixed media, but limitations of studio, um, materials everything just kind of led me to pare it down to the most important thing which is the storytelling in my opinion um but yeah it's iterations on iterations i think is just making so much work that you really know what you want to produce and share with people i guess um for me um I would definitely say like <laughs> I'm like anti-style, anti, -style, anti <laughs> limitations. No lie, no lie. Uh, to be honest, uh, what is this? I think uh, for a lot of my uh, artistic career, and I've only recently made this shift a couple, maybe like two years ago at this point. Um, I was so focused on technical craft. Technical craft was like my my thing. Like I was like, all right, well, this is gonna be the most technically <laughs> rendered piece that you can get. And uh, what I found is that I lost, uh, you know, well, this is what I would do. I would, I would try to get the most technically rendered uh, piece in a specific style that I was looking at. Right? And that would be something that I would like focus on and hone in and uh, craft and craft and craft and train and train and train. Um, and then like, you know, the more I did that, the more I lost uh, myself in terms of like what I was communicating through work. Um, so for me, like I'm, I'm more at a point where I'm like, uh, you know, uh, I don't care about the rules. <laughs> if there's a rule, break it, break it. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, that's, that's, you know, that's kind of uh, where I'm at because my thing is like, okay, well, the piece needs to communicate something that I can't communicate in words anyway. Now, there's a, something to be said about technical crap and being understanding of like styles and being understanding and knowledgeable of styles as well as techniques. That way you can, like, you know what you're looking at to break. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, like, I'm more at a, uh, at a space of wanting to break things so people feel comfortable uh, being their realest self, not a, um, yeah. not a reproduction or not a, 
not a copy or not an expectation. So mm -hmm. um, that's that's kind of what I think about when I think about like uh, style and limits. This is exactly why we. It's good to have multiple voices in art because these are all great ideas. Mm -hmm. I'm done with this one. <laughs> but uh, okay. I think I'm okay. Thanks. That's dope. Yeah. That's so I think from this point, what I would probably do is I would, um, I'd take some pallet wood and cut it down. And then I, I have a wood planer to kind of make, give a nice, uh, you know, it, a wood planer really like sands or whatever and just sort of cuts it down to make the uniform. But, um, probably make a floating frame and set this in that floating frame um, and but I'll probably uh, probably varnish this with a spray um, not sure if I'll use a mat or a gloss on this one but, um, but that would be my next step with that so I'll, I'll let this dry for a couple days probably but I'm gonna pick up uh, I'm gonna go back to the other one I was working on and, uh, and try, to, try to aim kind of towards that similar thing I'm going to attempt to reconnect with my phone here in a minute so you can guys see what I'm working on. My phone's at about 70%. So. This kind of got a Fibonacci vibe about it. There is another question for all artists. Um, kind of like what is an obstacle maybe caused by your medium and how do you work around these obstacles and limitations? I guess I'll go for that one, try and see if I can answer that. I think first off we gotta say pre-pandemic. <laughs> because everything kind of changed this year. But I think my biggest obstacle has been how much I can produce. Um, I was scheduling about two shows a month before COVID. And I'm whipping through this today, but typically I spend, I don't know, 20 hours or so probably on something. And... I'd like to bring about 40 originals with me to a show. So it was becoming a challenge to just have enough work to take everywhere. And I eventually, you know, it makes sense of course, but I now offer prints of all of my original illustrations. And that kind of became the biggest workaround was 
the ability to reuse these images um, because like we've all said, I don't want to make the same thing over and over again. I'm making this once and then I'm, you know, my brain's moving on to another idea. So however, you know, 10 people really relate with that. Now, at least I have an option that's both an affordable uh, piece for customers as well. For me, an obstacle is dry time. Mm -hmm. um, because of all the texture I use. Um, and I mean, one, I guess one workaround is that I'll, I'll often be working on multiple pieces at the same time. So I can just kind of go from one to the next. Um, me personally, uh, what is it? Nothing much, uh, just because um, it's more digital, it's more uh, technical. Um, I think the biggest obstacle is like getting over how technical it is and still making something that is um, something that is uh, authentic to like you. Uh, because when you when you work in like this digital space, it becomes a little bit um, more designerly, and you look, kind of lose that uh, that tangible, that physical aspect of it. To where it's like, okay, where well, I'm a little bit more uh, free flow, and I can connect a little easier to like you know uh, the work I'm making. It's just remembering that as you're working digitally and like still doing like design type of things. Would you ever want to create your own video game, Keenan? Oh my goodness, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, what is it? Um, I, I've been uh, actually doing a lot of uh, coding in JavaScript uh, recently and uh, trying to make a, what is it, lower fidelity type of game. So like simple games where it's just, you know, the, the object of the game is like whatever symbolism I want to put into it. Um, but I've been on the other half of that, on the more like, you know, higher end production stuff, I've been making, what is it, um, higher fidelity 3D models and higher fidelity uh, 3D renders potentially to try to work with a, a more powerful uh, game development engine. So that way I can make like a, a, a more like, you know, a polished game or the, it's kind of the <laughs> game that you see today, right? Uh, so that is, that is a goal of mine, for sure. I love it. Yeah. That was, I had uh, grand ideas of developing my characters into game format as well. And, you know, maybe you're this, uh, you're a toad that walks around and eats things and it, you know, it changes you in some way. So turns out it's way more complicated <laughs> than just having a great idea and some illustrations. So yeah, well, no, like um, the, the energy of your pieces does fit a specific type of game very well. It's like a, um, it's, it's more of a uh, story slash environment uh, type of game where you go through yeah. like uh, this detailed, uh, very uh, visceral in terms of its uh, in terms of its music and its atmosphere. Those type of games like uh, exist, and I can definitely see that being adapted to that type of game. Yeah, like I, that's that's one of the reasons I love games because they could just be purely an artistic experience. Like you know, it doesn't have to be like a. A, a challenge or a skill-based test. It could just be showing you an interactive mode of story. So, 
I love that. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely want to make one day too. What'd you say? I said I definitely want to make a game one day too. Oh, oh for sure. yeah. For sure. I want to play all the games. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, when I get this game development pipeline up, I will let you all know. You're going to need to let us all know. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I became a big fan of Hollow Knight on the Switch. Um, yes. And in terms, like you're saying, of aesthetic and environment and mood and... Uh, you know, that's where, you know, my brain thought, hey, 2D platformer, surely we can figure something with that out. And it's mm -hmm. still, it's beyond any capability I have, technologically speaking. But I could see a world like that, you know, fleshed out. And uh, yeah, maybe it's not about skill. It's just that you're a, you're a guinea pig trying to eat as much stuff as you possibly can. And, you know, spending time in through their eyes. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's real. Hollow Knight is literally a perfect example. Like, uh, you know, another game uh, called Journey. If you get the chance to check it out, uh, it's a it's a really uh, story focused game. It's about just atmosphere. It's not you know as difficult as Hollow Knight, um, but yeah. you know, like it, it lets you just go through the game like at any skill level, just as an interactive piece. Say the name of the game again. Uh, it's called Journey, and I'll I'll put it in our chat. Mm -hmm. I watched a video from it. It looks really nice. It looks great. Mm. Yeah, I'm a huge sort of turn-based tactics RPG nerd. Oh, and nice. Yeah, I love games. Like on the Super Nintendo, old school. Old yeah, school. yeah. The Final Fantasies and whatnot, or am I in the wrong genre? Uh, no, I mean, that's, that's cool. I, I like Final Fantasy. Uh, I know like Final Fantasy VI was good, but probably one of my favorite games is called Tactics Over. It came out in 1996 for the Super Nintendo. It's like sort of the isometric turn based. You have know, huge quality of tasks. I would love to make those. Yeah, that's for the. I don't know, maybe like 700 people will play this. Hmm. <laughs> I'm sure there's more people that like There's another question in the chat for Keenan. Um, so someone said that you said earlier when you were focusing exclusively on technical prowess, you lost yourself and what you were trying to communicate. And how do you see yourself and what you're trying to communicate expressed in this artwork today? Oh, this artwork specifically. Yeah. <laughs> this artwork, uh, the title of it is Hero. The title of it is Hero. And um, what is it? The, the idea behind this work is that, um, you know, uh, it, it kind of takes the... Hmm, let me let me figure out how to, a way to describe it because now I got I to gotta separate from it a little bit <laughs> to talk about it. Um, what is it? It's uh, the thing that I was thinking about when I started to uh, create this piece was that there is a long cinematic history in Hollywood of the white savior trope. Long cinematic history of the white savior trope in Hollywood, right? And what I wanted to do is I wanted to create this scene where there's this black god and a white savior. And you hear the term, like you hear the... Uh, title hero and you're just looking at this is like oh okay well this must be an evil being in the back but it switches your interpretation um you know after you hear the explanation that this is actually a um black old god that uh is being slain by the hero so that was you know the the concept behind this piece wow that's very cool thank you so much for sharing hmm. And there's another question for you, Keenan. Um, so somebody asks, could you print your piece on any home printer or is it too complex for that? It can, it can be printed on a, a home printer, but it's always best to, uh, you know, order prints because the the paper, it's, it's really about the paper, right? It's really about the paper. Like you can print it on a home printer and it could come out fine uh, depending on 
the cardstock that you use, that's this is basically just the thickness of the paper. If the paper is thick enough and you have like um, a printer that can support that uh, level of thickness, then it, it's fine. It should be fine. Uh, but me, like, you know, I would always advise you to like get a print ordered from somebody who like does prints. Like that's the best way to really get uh, the quality <laughs> as opposed to having just like, you know, these uh these printer lines and you know it's faded uh you know like it's it's good to have like a a, a professional print if you can get it okay cool interesting thank you mm -hmm. And there's a question for you in the chat. They're asking, how heavy will your finished piece be? Um, this particular one is going to be pretty light because um, I'm going to show you the back of it. Um, I some, somehow uh, my session ended. Um, I'm back. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure what happened, um, but my session ended. Uh, I was answering the question about um, how heavy this is going to be. It's n it's not going to be that heavy. It's it's going to be like maybe a couple of pounds. But the piece of wood that I'm painting on is pretty light. It's only about an eighth inch, and uh, 
yeah so a lot of my work is super heavy but this one is this one's going to be a little lighter Here's a question for Lydia in the chat. Um, Thomas asked, if, with the art you're doing, are you able to do it on glass, porcelain, or stone? Oh boy. Um, I would think that, well, yes and no. I can't. <laughs> I uh, am not adept at those materials, but I don't see why any illustration couldn't be done on those kind of things. Um, unless I'm misunderstanding the question, but I prefer the wood texture just uh, for my own aesthetic and the visceral pleasure of carving into something is very satisfying. Um, but I am definitely inspired by an amalgam of stained glass, tattoos, um, illuminated manuscripts, um, Southern United States outsider artists. Um, so really just a wide variety of things. just kind of finished up uh what is it just the last touches of this piece um so i guess just to talk a little bit about it and like the process um in terms of uh making it when i uh first started off with this piece it was kind of just um you know throwing concepts at the wall and just seeing like what's stuck and just doing a lot of uh, shape carving. So if you remember towards the beginning of the stream and you can scroll back in the video, uh, it's just these like weird shapes. They could look kind of like people, kind of like mountains, but they don't really look like anything. Um, and that's a technique that I learned uh, from, what is it, this one artist, I, I forget his name, but he is, um, you know, his alias is the shape carver. Um, and he's a, a concept artist who works really uh, well in terms of just carving out uh, silhouettes, right? Carving out silhouettes and putting value on top of it. So I kind of started with that um, as the first step and then I jumped off of it. <laughs> started shape carving and then said, all right, I'm done with that. I'm bored of it. 
let's start doing value and then i went back and forth so like i'll have like a whole bunch of overlaying value and tone until i figure out what it is that i want to render and figure out the shapes and the values and where they go so it's never really like oh like i'm just doing shape carving and i'm just figuring out the silhouette or the thumbnail of the piece and how the piece is going to look like and then getting the values it's, it's never really that straightforward for me it's kind of both going back and forth between like okay well, we're just going to render out and blend this value we're just going to blend this value down and so something makes more sense um and then we'll go back to shape carving and just erasing and erasing and repositioning stuff so that's kind of how it works this, this is how this piece kind of came to be Thank you, Keenan, so much for sharing your process and your final piece looks amazing. Um, just for the rest of the artists, there are about 30 more minutes left um, in your time slot. I feel like it went by really quickly. Um, we do have one question for Lydia in the chat. Um, somebody asks you, Lydia, do you approach each piece individually from start to finish as you are today? Or do you have blocks of time where you are sketching, carving, um, etc. multiple pieces or do you have quote unquote sketching day, carving day, etc. Um, I used to work more like that. I used to work more production style when I was trying to create, like I had said before, enough work to take to shows. But since I have kind of transitioned to uh, life at home and you know working through the interwebs and selling off my website and whatnot I'm kind of taking it piece by piece now um, where I can really devote more time to each thing obviously today is not quite the case uh, as it usually is but I do pretty much work on one thing at a time now I, I uh, it lets me focus a little more on it I think and make each piece a little more special focus on the details and the story of that one and really take the time to think about it um we'll see what happens if you know if i go back to doing multiple shows a month then i'm gonna have to go back to the production style but i i really think i'm making better work in a start to finish capacity on one thing so I hope I can keep working this way. There's a question for Kofi. Um, they're asking, do you work on special paper or do you have a specific background you prefer? Um, do I work on special paper? Correct. Uh, yeah, I use, uh, basically it's just manga paper, B4 size paper. It's called Manga Genko Yochi, which is manga manuscript paper. Um, it's just sort of the standard paper that's used. And the reason why I use this, you guys can't really see it here, but there are a lot of blue lines that are measurements on the, on the, the outskirts of the paper. And it shows us where we're, like, Basically, there are standards to how um, it will fit in a, in a given publisher's magazine, and there are guidelines so you can follow those standards. And it's this blue ink that doesn't show up during the print. I use this very specific size and very specific uh, guidelines on the paper for like how to size my panels and spaces between panels and stuff like that.
And there was was there a follow up question? The question was, do you have specific background you prefer? Background? Mm -hmm. Um, not really. Um, most of my pieces weren't heavy in the background. I like to do a lot of. I switch off between dialogue scenes, which um, when you really get the dialogue going, you really only need sort of an establishing shot, which that's sort of, that's a film term, but it's useful in comics. You get an establishing shot to show where your characters are. Um, but then if you look at most comics, after you have the establishing shot, when it's going back and forth in the scene, the backgrounds can be very blank because you don't want them to be too distracting because you've already put in the reader's mind where the place is. Um, so I like those because they're not background heavy and it's kind of like just blank in the background. Um, or action scenes, I like to draw the backgrounds are really abstract and it's um, like you use speed lines, which are things that communicate movement. Um, and I really like having fun with abstract lines. Um, the reason why I'm doing backgrounds in these pieces that you guys see here is this this chapter, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of scene changes, so I need constant um, establishing shots because I keep moving the the location of the scene. I usually don't do this many backgrounds though, because I don't much care for drawing backgrounds. I prefer drawing figures.
Well, going back to one of those earlier conversations about knowing when to finish, I think I, I think I'm at a finishing place with this one now. I'll try to bring it up a little close, show some of the detail, and um, one of the things that I tend to do is uh, try to let the fabric pop out. Um, almost by like a similar technique of like a grave rubbing, you know, where I'm just barely touching over it. Um, just trying to see some of those added details being exposed. Super cool, Jason. Yeah. Thanks. It's interesting you liken it to a grave rubbing as well. Have, are you a cemetery goer? Um, I'm not a cemetery goer. I imagine I'll spend a lot of time there one day, but for now, <laughs> I don't. I don't go there much. <laughs> Huh, I guess those kind of like connect together more than I thought. I, I actually wasn't planning on these being like a triptych or anything. But I do see how, it's interesting how these lines sort of connect right here, if you can see that. Oh yeah. Flows up that way. It almost has a bit of a yin-yang vibe going on. That was definitely unplanned. But I'm kind of digging that. <laughs>
Okay, artists, we do have about 15 minutes left of the stream. Um, before we do end the stream, about five or ten minutes left, we hope we could get a group photo of the current work you have and even a group photo of all of your faces. But continue creating, doing what you're doing. So do you want us to like reset some of that like our art out that we've created right now? I'm sorry, may you please repeat that? Are you wanting are you wanting me to put some of like the finished work back in frame? Is that kind of what you'd like? Yes. Okay. So sort of have like a group photo of everyone's work and also everyone's portrait. Hi artists, if there's any um, last comments you want to make about 8 to create in general, about your art, um, or just to let the audience know before we wrap up, um, this is your last chance, so feel free to go ahead. Um, Kofi here, I really appreciate you guys tuning in. Um, it's pretty dope to be just drawing and talking. I feel like uh, even though during this whole pandemic going on right now, I feel like I'm actually drawing with friends again. So this, this has been quite nice. Yes, this has definitely been a novel experience. I have never live streamed working, so Thank you to 8 to create for having the virtual show this year. I thought at first, you know, I'd be, oh, I'm, I'm missing out on experiencing this at Cranard Art Museum in the gallery like you usually do, but it's nice in some ways to be able to invite you into, you know, my private workspace, which is something I don't share a lot of. So I hope it was interesting for the folks watching. Thank you. Um, and it was really great chatting with all you other artists here, getting to hear about some wildly different styles and lots of talent. So thank you guys. Yeah, and thanks for hosting the event also. Uh, I, really, I really appreciate it. This has been a great opportunity. It's been a lot of fun. I agree. Like, this has been super awesome. Uh, what is it? Like, me being, like, more of an exclusively digital artist, this is, funny enough, the only way I'd be able to participate in this realistically. So I'm super grateful. Like, I'm, I'm grateful that it's a virtual event. Like, you know, I'm, I'm happy that I was able to participate and, you know, hear a lot about everybody else's practices and, like, journeys to practice. So um, this was this was awesome. Very grateful to uh, A to Create and everybody who uh, is watching. Yeah, I really uh, enjoyed all the community. I enjoyed um, just kind of getting to create with other artists and hearing the the background um, from so many of you. And it was just kind of a really peaceful experience. And uh, yeah, and, you know, thanks for letting me be a part of it. And yeah, that's all I want to say. But should um so are you still wanting like uh you're wanting us to like close it uh, next to uh, artwork um 
you just let me know when you you prefer that. Yeah, we won't do that until around like two. So we still have about ten minutes for you guys to kind of finish up your pieces, um, and then we'll close out the live stream, and then we'll go ahead and do that just privately. Um, so yeah, you've got about 10 minutes to finish up your work and make any last comments about your work. Um, or if anyone has any more questions on YouTube, um, we've got a few minutes and then we'll close out.
So our last question um, for this group is a great prompt for you guys to plug yourselves. <laughs> um, the question is, I don't know if this has been asked, but how do you all share your artwork um, and your process otherwise in general? Do you do live streams on social media? And what are some other ways that you share your art? Um, if you guys have websites or social medias, as I know you do, um, this is a great time for you to mention them. Um, because I know everyone on the other end on YouTube would definitely be interested in keeping in touch with you guys. Well, yeah, um, I definitely do like a lot of my stuff. Uh, since most of my stuff is digital, um, I love to like, what is it? Uh, just share it all on social media. Um, I also started a Patreon recently. So it's uh, patreon.com backslash Keenan Daily where I'm starting to do more um, art tutorials as well as design and coding tutorials for people who are trying to get into art as well as sharing some of the ways in which I work with, like, um, with, with more specificity. And I'm also interested in getting into more uh, live streams. I share most of my stuff though uh, for quick access is on instagram.com backslash Keenan E. Daily. So that's, that's where my stuff is. I'm, I share stuff online all the time. Yeah, we share a lot of stuff on Instagram. Uh, Instagram is manga, just K O F I dot M A N G A. And um, our website is Pokey. Pokey on uh, the boxing career too. That's also on my social media. I've got a special site coming up that's for the ages too. And I am on Instagram. Um, I that's the only place I share on socials, so it's just at Lydia Puddycomb. Um, I know that's not an easy last name to spell, but I'm sure you can find me through 8 to Create's uh, tagged posts. And you can also check out my website at LydiaPuddyComb.com. And on there, I have featured sections of collections of storytelling. So I work within a few different uh, topics of ghost, ghost stories for the faint of heart. Uh, you can check out you can check out the botanic lives of guinea pigs. Um, I talk about my dog a lot on there, and I'm gonna update my store this afternoon with um, new originals. I also offer free coloring pages on there of a lot of my newer works. I'm uh, so I hope you'll check it out. And thank you so much for tuning in. Um, this is Jason Racco. Um, so. My last name is spelled R-A-C-K-O-W, and my website is racko.art, R-A-C-K-O-W.art. Um, it just has a little bit of like a gallery, almost Instagram style. It's not, it's not a great website, um, but you can contact me through there um, if you um, have any interest in doing that. Um, but I'm also on Instagram, uh, instagram.com slash Jason Racco. Again, it's R A C K O W. But I think that there was one of the eight to create tagged posts on Instagram. So uh, I think you could find me that way. Um, also on Facebook, and I, I will tend to just kind of post a lot of my updates just to my Facebook friends. But um, I think I've got one of those profiles you could just follow. Um, you can follow Jason Racco. Um, and I do have a Facebook page that I don't use a lot, which is Jason Racco Abstract Art, but those are just some places. And I, I'm interested in getting into live streaming. Um, I'd like to do that soon, and this is kind of a catalyst to that, but I also have a, um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so at this point, I think we're going to wrap up our first set of live stream um so thank you so much to all of the artists um for coming out well i guess you didn't come out you normally do but <laughs> joining us on a saturday and spending so much time um 
maybe this was early in the morning for you. So we appreciate that. Um, and thank you for letting us in to your creative process. I know this is a very unconventional time as an, as, an, as an artist that takes a lot of courage to let us in and watch you do your skill for such a long amount of time. So we really appreciate that. Um, we had so much fun on our end and it seems like those on the live stream did as well. So we hope you guys had as much fun interacting and um, doing your work as we did watching you. Um, and so thank you also to all those who tuned in on YouTube and be sure to follow HCreate and you can come back to the same exact link at 3 p.m. And you'll be able to see our next set of four artists, Michael Darren, Nikki Kelsey, Claire Melinda and Jihee Lee. So it will be a whole new set of artists and we'll be doing the same thing all over again. Um, yeah, so thank you so much to all of those for participating in the live stream and we'll see you again soon in just an hour. Bye guys. Awesome. Yeah. An artist.